This is Julie Bell, and you're listening to Monsters, Madness, and Magic. All right, folks. Welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with artist, illustrator, and bodybuilder Julie Bell about witches, painting freely, fitness, Boris Vallejo, overcoming challenges on the canvas, and more. As always, thank you all for listening out there. And if you'd like to help the show grow and you're listening on your podcasting platform of choice, please leave us a review. If you happen to be watching the video on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe because it does help. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. Julia, take us back in time. You're a youngster. Are you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all the above? Ah. Oh. Um, well, I can't say I was much of a book reader, honestly. I mean, I, I didn't have anything against reading books. I loved reading some books, but it wasn't my real thing. I definitely was a fort builder and a tree climber, um, but I was more of a picture drawer um, than a book reader. And I loved also books with pictures, you know, that I could look at art in them and that kind of thing. So whereabouts did you grow up? Uh, in Beaumont, Texas. Where are you from? I'm from South Carolina. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Right yeah, near well, the, I the border. Texas until I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, at the border between Georgia? And... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So around Columbia, I guess? Yeah, it's closer to Augusta. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I also lived, I went to high school. My high school years were in an, at the Atlanta, Georgia area. Oh, wow. So sometimes we'd go to South Carolina or North Carolina. You said you were drawing pictures, obviously. What's what's the earliest thing that you can remember enjoying drawing? Oh, well, okay. It wasn't so much joy enjoying, <laughs> but I, I did get a fixation with witches when I was really young because just a lot of different reasons, um, one of them being the Wizard of Oz, um, but also other weird stuff in my life that was, you know. But anyway, I got fixated on witches, and I would draw witches everywhere. That's cool. <laughs> and, I, and on your bio, you were born in October, so it's kind of Halloween-y. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and my youngest sister is born on Halloween. Wow. But she's, a witch. she's just a sweet angel. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you into Halloween growing up at all, or was it just, you know, oh, just yeah. when you, so you were big into Halloween? Yeah, I loved costumes, and I loved the trick-or-treat because that was my... Um, you know, especially as I got older and got to go out with my friends instead of my parents and stuff. Um, so much pranking can be done. <laughs> <laughs> right. So when it comes to, would you say that either one of your parents were uh, artistically or creatively inclined? Do you think that's where your roots lie in regards to that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, my father was an architect mm. and um, definitely had a, you know, strong artistic side to that. And um my mother was a very artistic person, but she had a lot of, you know, mental problems, hence the fixation on the witches. <laughs> um, and so she could never, she did some paintings, like she would just decide to do a painting out of the blue, and it was actually really good, um, but she never really spent a lot of time, you know, developing it or anything. She didn't have any kind of formal training or anything, but she was very, very artistic person. She could just create whatever mm -hmm. she'd go to a movie and see somebody in a dress she liked and she'd go home and make that dress you know or whatever right. she'd just do all kinds of cool things like that that's really cool early on would you say that uh maybe it was a parent or a a teacher or something did they notice that you know your drawings were a bit more than a regular kid scribbling on a piece of paper <laughs> yeah i mean i did used to get in trouble for um drawing when i shouldn't have been at school um, but I, I, I mean, my teachers really were very encouraging to me in many, many ways. Like they could see that I needed a parent figure to come in and kind of do that. And they, I mean, I'm so grateful when I think back on, you know, specific moments when a teacher really pulled me aside and gave me a talking to about, you know, all that. And, uh, and I, and definitely seeing what I was doing with drawings and that kind of thing, they really encouraged it, but it didn't really get that much encouragement until high school um, when I was in the Georgia area. And I, you know, like teachers would actually have me 
do things that were specific for the school, you know, do like a portrait of this teacher that's retiring or things like that. And in my senior year, um, the teacher gave me like she had a big art closet with all the art materials in it. And she let that be my own private studio, which was amazing. Wow, so that's... she gave me the space, you know, and uh, just gave me all the materials I wanted and just she didn't really instruct me or anything, but she gave me whatever I needed to work on my art, you know, making paintings at the time I was, I was just like teaching myself with acrylic, you mm -hmm. know, and I would copy photos from National Geographic or something like that. Gotcha. Now you just mentioned Wizard of Oz. I wanted to ask you, like when you think back to other uh, films and TV shows you grew up on, what comes to mind? My, one of my favorite shows was Gilligan's Island. Um... <laughs> I just had a crush on Gilligan. <laughs> <laughs> I annoy my wife all the time by just walking around the house singing the Gilligan's Island theme, whistling or something. <laughs> I just love that show. Um, yeah, I mean, I did really grow up in front of a TV set in a big way. You know, um, that was actually a big part of my childhood. And so there were so many shows that I liked. That one really does stand out. Hmm. Did you go to the movies or anything? like? Were you a big movie going kid or anything like that, going to the theater? Yeah, not, I mean, um, I didn't go a lot, you know, I would go as a thing to do with my friends, like, especially they had um, Saturday matinee stuff where kids could go and, and spend the day there. It was kind of amazing that they did that. They would have like a couple of movies, like Jerry Lewis kind of stuff, you know, or um, those Walt Disney movies, not the cartoons, but the, you know, can't remember the name of it like the ones with the cat and the guy with the sneakers. I don't remember, but yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> Kurt Russell yeah. stuff, you know? Um, and so we would go and spend the day throwing popcorn at each other and acting crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You almost forget that Kurt Russell's early career was all Disney before he was like in the thing and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, know. I love him. So good. So uh, something I like to ask everyone just cause you never know is uh, what scared you as a kid? Witches, for sure. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, I mean, uh, I was kind of like super brave and super scared at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I was definitely also really scared of ghosts until I was like in my 20s, really, to the point where uh, when I lived in a house, the first house that I was in when I was married to my first husband, you know, um, and we had a basement that actually is, it was a very scary basement because it was this really old house with us. It was in upper Michigan and it was like down in the, they didn't have basements in Texas, first of all, or we didn't have a basement in Georgia, but um, this basement was like partially dirt and stone and stuff. So it was just like dug into the ground, but it was partially a little bit finished. And the washing machine was down there and I was really like scared to do the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just really scared of ghosts and I don't know what was a big deal. But anyway, at one point I was like, I really just can't live this way. I have to do the laundry. <laughs> and so I was just like, all right, you know, just ghost, just let's have a deal. Just don't touch me and don't let me see you. You could do whatever ever you want. Just don't touch me. And don't let me see you. <laughs> was it just like a creepy feeling or did you actually have some things like happen that made you I never consider... had any ghost, ghost encounters. I just was terrified of the idea. I think it was just probably watching movies or, uh, you know, okay. whatever that gave me the feeling. And that whole thing of like something jumping out to get you, you know, that was extremely scary for me. So do you have a, if you could have to pinpoint to where you had the confidence in yourself to where you thought you could pursue art as maybe a profession? Like, where does that begin? Well, um, so I didn't really start in a real way until after I met Boris mm. when I was 30 years old. But before that, I had, uh, that was my goal was to be, um, I mean, to be an illustrator. And um, I, even like in high school, I, when I was working on those paintings, I really felt like, you know, I could do something pretty good. And then I went to community college and I really was very encouraged by my teachers and that. I remember I made some samples to send publishers. I thought, I want to do children's books. And so I I made some drawings 
and I just went to the like the library and I got some books of that had pictures that were similar to the kind of thing I would want to do. And I looked up publishers' names and addresses, just sent, you know, drawings to these publishers. And I actually, the first thing I sent out, I actually got an actual letter back from a person, you know, an editor, art director or somebody. And they said, we really like your style. Could you send us some more samples? And I just kind of freaked out. So I was just like not ready mentally for this to happen. And so I never did. It was just really dumb. Uh, that's what happened is I just, it, it was too big for my head at that moment. And I was, I had my little kids at that time. They were very young and I just mentally wasn't ready for it. So I didn't do anything. And then later I sent out letters to another bunch of publishers and I got nothing back <laughs> or form <laughs> letters saying no. So that just never happened that way, you know? Yeah. But it was so interesting that it started out with this open door and I just was like, ah, not ready for that, you know? <laughs> um, but anyway, then after I met Boris, I was 30 years old and, you know, um, I really thought I want to bring back art into my life because I, I had gotten kind of sidetracked with doing bodybuilding and competing and I was doing like personal training people and that kind of thing. And I actually, at that time, I thought I wanted to go into studying to be a physical therapist um, mm. for a while. But um, then I thought, okay, I really want to get back to my art. And so uh, I showed him my things and he was like, you're really good. So he just showed me some things to learn. And, you know, he showed me like, what was I not seeing? What was I not doing to make it more professional? And I watched him paint and um, made some samples. And then, I mean, it really... You know, having a professional artist of any kind, but especially Boris, you know, behind me, it made me feel 100% confident because then I felt like, it, you know, if anything scares me or I don't know what to do, I can just ask him, you know. So yeah. <laughs> having, a, having a mentor or somebody, you know, I mean, everybody can't always do that, but finding somebody that's doing something similar to what you um, want to do really I think it makes a huge difference because before I knew him, I had only known art teachers. I had never known anybody who worked uh, as a professional artist. Right. Yeah. So it really, um, you know, I think it makes such a difference when you, when you can actually meet with the person who's in that world, because it's a very mysterious world and it feels really like impossible to know, like, where's the door? How do you get in? You know? So Right. And obviously, you know, everyone knows you're successful now. Do you still deal with uh, imposter syndrome or anything like that? Oh, well, for sure. I mean, I really have learned to just ride past it as much as I can, but it's absolutely, absolutely, you know, and I'll I'll get a commission and I feel like this is too big for me, you know, and I'm like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> remember like that's what i said back then and that's i just it's like other people can do these things you can do it too so mm. so w when did you become seriously interested in fitness was that before art that was your big passion you would say right well um i mean i was always really an athletic person i was never like a team sport person except for gymnastics which is more individual mm -hmm. i didn't like team sports like anything where you have to run and get hit by other people and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Have somebody blow whistles at you. That's not my deal. <laughs> I hate that. But um, I always loved, like I said, climbing trees. I said that earlier. I just um, loved using my body in a physical way that like that. Then I, I was in gymnastics in high school. And then um, I, and then I just got into bodybuilding when I was in my early twenties, my the man who was my husband at the time had bought a set of weights for himself to use at home. And I just kind of got into the feeling of it. I really enjoyed, you know, what it felt like to lift weights. Mm. It's just a great feeling in your body. And so it just kind of developed from there. Uh, I never thought I would get into competing or anything right away. And it, it, I didn't even know it was a thing to begin with. But um, once you know, once I just got into it, it's like you just get more and more into it. It's kind of hard to not follow that path, you know. Right. You know, it's unique that you say um, that you weren't a big reader growing up. Did that did that change over time when you start working more in fantasy and stuff? Did you grow a, a love for it? 
Um, well, at this point, I still don't really, I just don't have time to read that much because I'm doing art. I can't use my eyes for reading and that, but I love listening to books now. Um, so I do that and, um, you know, I really, I like, at this point, honestly, whatever, what I like to read the most is things to do with science. Because mm. I really like, uh, like, biology science, you know, I just, when I read about the structure of a cell, it's just like, oh, you know, it's so exciting to to read those things. Mm. I just can't get over how amazing it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, obviously, those uh, you have to pay the bills, so those corporate gigs, you know, like Nike, Nike, Coca Cola, and stuff are always nice. But would you say it's more enjoyable for you as an artist when you work more in the fantastical realm? Ab yeah, for sure. I mean, mm. that's that's really where. My I, my heart lies. I even when I do animal paintings, um, which I really, really love doing animal paintings. Um, I kind of tend to bring a an element of fantasy to it, and the more, like at this point, I'm doing that more. I'm yeah. allowing myself to just that's. I realize that that's that's my blood or something. I, um, you know, the fantasy stuff just offers. It gives me the ability to really like kind of speak from the heart of how I see things in the world. And like, to me, really everything feels pretty darn magical and, you know, just nature, just even things that are not what we consider nature. It's all nature because it's all on this earth. But, um, you know, I just uh, kind of live in a world that's pretty mo much more psychedelic than probably what a lot of people talk about. Mm. <laughs> you know, and it's just how I, I like to think about the world um, is 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 how I feel it that way. And so that doing the fantasy art allows that to come out, you know, more than any other genre of art, I suppose. I'd say that's a healthy way to look at things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Which, uh... I do too. I mean, I just love, you know, like letting everything be alive to me and, and, like letting everything kind of speak to me in that way, like not speak in words. I'm not hearing stuff, but I'm, you know, it's like I feel connected to everything that way. It's, I just, I just enjoy my life that way. Yeah, I feel that. Um, so, uh, which aspect of you know the art toolbox? I guess uh, is there something you struggled with early on? I'll just throw in something out there. You know, drawing hands or something like that. <laughs> I mean, for sure, my my drawing has you know gotten. I've gotten more control over it over the years. I guess my biggest stumbling thing early on was probably just proportions of figure. Like when I first started doing life drawings uh, in art school, that was the first, you know, that was something that I had to work on. And I would guess proportions is probably, mm. that's the thing that comes to mind right now. Yeah, drawing hands and all those things really, um, it's just, everything is basically shape and observation and you know one thing's really not harder than another mm. when it comes to that it's just that it, or how much how much patience are you going to have to really take it in you know what is it what is it showing you you know and i guess it's just coming from me i'm someone who cannot i know you hear this all the time probably i can't draw a stick figure uh, so when, <laughs> speaking to folks like you and michael whalen who are just you know great artists it just when i look at the pictures you guys have, it just seems otherworldly to me. Like, how did a person make this? <laughs> it's just great. It's fun that you feel that way. It's just, it's funny. I was just listening to a, a podcast where there was a guy who's a magician talking about how, um, you know, he understands how magicians work and what the tricks are about in that. I mean, he might see somebody do a trick that he doesn't know how they did it, but still he gets the the basic idea. And so, he can't see other people's magic tricks the same way that somebody who doesn't do it can. He can't enjoy it the same way. And in a way, that's a loss. But at the same time, it's just a deeper understanding of it. And, you know, I mean, I'm not saying I don't enjoy seeing Michael Whelan's work because I do. In fact, I just saw a painting of his that I had never seen before um, of a character of this character, Elric. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, there's this one of him um, on the ship. You know the ship that's the that goes over the land and sea. Oh my God, that painting is so beautiful. You know, it's so beautiful. It's just, but anyway, 
you know, being an artist yourself, you're just looking at it so different from somebody who is not doing that kind of right. skill. Right. Speaking of El Elric, I noticed on your Instagram you were working on a giant painting of Elric. Are you still, is that, that completed? Yeah, it is. I'm going to actually be posting that uh, in the next probably a few days. That's the thing that's taken up my space where I normally oh. put the camera. <laughs> <laughs> what was the inspiration for that? Were you just, you just wanted to draw on Elric or did you get, was it a commission? No. Yeah, it was a commission. Um, yeah, it was a commission. So, um, and then it inspired me to read the book, which I had not read it before, um, but I wanted to read it so that I could understand the character better. And um, in the meantime, I've got another commission to do another Elric painting. So it's going to be really cool. big one, big, big. So it's going to be cool. Wow, that's awesome. So generally speaking, do you go forward with a painting with a with a set image in your head and that's what comes out on the canvas or is it shifting as you as you paint? Yeah, no, it's it. I don't know if it ever comes out just like I pictured it to start with. Mm. And yeah, I, I, I guess you know, I have the approach of like I'm not trying to duplicate, you know, anything. I'm just I'm making this painting, and I have to keep in mind this is a painting, and the painting will, as you're working on it, it's just like so many other things where you know. You start and then something gets suggested to you either by the piece itself or just you have another thought or whatever and it takes it in a little different direction and sometimes it's like really really different direction and if you fight with that if you can learn to like cooperate with that i think that's where i get the best results mm -hmm. if you if i fight with it and try to you know stick with the plan which sometimes you have to do if you have a commission you know, like say for a corporate job, you know, Coca-Cola or Nike or Ford Motors or something like that. If you don't stick with the sketch that you gave them and keep it pretty close to that, then they really are going to have a problem with that because they've all approved it with a billion committees and whatever. And so they have to do a whole new process. So um, aside from that kind of stuff, and, and I do think that that takes away a little bit from the life of a painting when there's too much trying to hold on to anything in particular. You know, I think you get more life in it if you allow it to kind of be a partner with you in its creation. Mm -hmm. So do you listen to music or anything while you work? Yeah. Um, first of all, Boris really is, he's always been really, really into classical music for his whole life. And um, so he, you know, before I knew him, even he would listen to music all the time as he was working. And um, so then I did not really, I mean, I just listened to classical music and I, there were some things that I really loved, but I didn't know that much about it when I met him. And so, but I knew all this other stuff that he didn't know. He never even heard of David Bowie, really. I mean, <laughs> heard of him, but he didn't know the music. There were so many things he didn't know. And so I get to introduce him to all these amazing, you know, music from what I like. And he got to teach me all this stuff about classical music that we've been together 35 years now. And so we both exchanged our musical knowledge and, it's amazing. We every other day, it's like one day it's his day to put the music on, and next day it's my day to put the music on. So we take turns being the DJ for the day, and <laughs> um, and so yeah, and it's it's just amazing because um, I love that I've learned to like hear the voice of you know different composers that I never even knew existed before I knew Boris. Right. So it's yeah. So did what sort of music did you like growing up? Personally, just curious. Well, I mean, I just loved, you know, the like rock music. I love trying to think of like, do you know the music of like Scott Joplin, like ragtime type stuff? I'm not familiar. No. Um, it's it's really fun. Um, but anyway, I love that. I love rock music. I love I just love all kinds of music. And when I was about like eleven or so years old, this friend of mine who was a girl who came from Norway to live where like right down the street from me in Texas taught me how to play the guitar and um so when that happened i got into a lot of folk music because that's what she was teaching me mm. uh, but you know i just really i pretty much enjoy just most most kinds of music um i really like to hear what any artist who's a serious artist is bringing to you know to their thing and um understand you know the different things that are happening right do you still play guitar I do. Yeah, I actually, um, yeah, I, I learned from her the spoke guitar and I really enjoyed it a lot. And then 
I didn't play for a really long time. And then at one point later, I decided I wanted to learn classical guitar after hearing all this beautiful classical guitar music that Boris would play. And so I took some lessons and, oh my God, I just really, really love that. But that's something that classical guitar, especially like Spanish stuff. And, you know, it's like, if you don't practice every day, you lose it. Your hands just cannot keep up. It's, it's a physical, you know, exercise that's grueling. <laughs> and you, and some of those chords are like, wow, it hurts really bad. <laughs> But I love that stuff. And I and then I quit. I just had to stop because I didn't have time to put in the time practicing. Mm -hmm. And I still play. And one of my sons, Anthony Palumbo, he's also an artist, but he is a fantastic jazz guitar player and all kinds of other music. He's so good. Like he understands all this theory of music that he can just do whatever. You know, I don't think he does classical music, but he does any of these things. He can improvise and all that. And so he teaches me some stuff with that, and we play together, and it's really, really fun. Yeah, if you can play jazz, you can play anything. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And playing with somebody else is really fun. That was one thing that was a trick for me with the classical, is that I wasn't, like, aside from playing it for Boris or just people in my family, I was way too stage frighty to play in front of anybody else except my, even my teacher, I was scared to play in front of my teacher. <laughs> it's like, you can't really, you know, I mean, it's just not that, it's fun to play by yourself, but it's just not that, it's not the same enjoyment as if you're playing with other people. Right. And so it kind of just like made it where like, why am I doing this? You know, I'm, not, I'm too scared to play in front of anybody. I don't want to go through the stress of doing that. So I'll just do other stuff, you know, and <laughs> When we, when we play, when I play music with my son, it's really super fun. I meant to ask you this earlier. What was the uh, what was the catalyst for you moving from Texas to Georgia? Oh, uh, my parents got divorced. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. and my mom took us to Georgia. And it, that Georgia is where you went to uh, art school. It's where I started. Um, yeah, I um, would. I was. It was a community college called DeKalb County Community College. And I went there for a couple of years and then um, I moved back to Texas to, visit, to stay with my dad and I went to college there. And then I met the man that was going to become my husband and we moved a few times and I went to school wherever he was. Hmm. So it was always just going to different colleges and universities and studying, you know, majoring in art, studying art. Um, so I had all these different teachers and, you know, it wasn't like some great art school, but let me tell you, man, community college has some my best teachers were there and um you know it's like it's not really like the name of the school or anything that makes a great art teacher for sure right but, yeah i had some fantastic teachers in that community college so if you don't mind telling the story of me asking how did you and boris meet um well i had been competing in bodybuilding and um a guy who promoted the last actually the last contest that I was ever planning to be and I decided that I was going to hang it up and not do it anymore um and he um was somebody who decided to have a party for all the people who had been in his contest and I won his contest and so he invited me to this party and Boris was also a friend of his so you know we just kind of met like that so then yeah when you guys are working on a piece together how does this is it is it different each time? Does do you start and then Boris tries or vice versa? Yeah, I mean it's really different each time. You know, um, it just depends on different factors. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like it, it's like for one thing, if it's something that has a really fast deadline, like usually like any kind of advertising work or that kind of thing, they want things like within a ridiculously short time, mm -hmm. um, and so we will often even some of those paintings we make them like in separate pieces like we'll you know we'll do one painting that's just the background and then the characters or whatever separately and then put it together you know we have to paint them i don't want to paint digitally but we want it, we put it together digitally so that they can also have the flexibility to change whether it's you know horizontal or vertical or whatever kind of thing they want to use it for for whatever their commercial is. I know you did the cover art for Bad Out of Hell 3. Did you ever get a chance to meet Meatloaf before he passed? 
I never met him in person. I talked to him on the phone quite a few times. I see him at a concert, but I didn't get to meet him. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. But you did get to, you went to a meatloaf show? Yes. Yeah, I never got around to being able to see one, but I've always heard that he's one of, he was a great live performer. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It's insane. <laughs> You're like, man, just calm down. I don't want you to hurt yourself. <laughs> <laughs> he was so on. It was crazy. So is there any, uh, yeah, there's no contact between, you know, someone like Meatloaf and the artist, but how much input is there from the corporate side of things when you send something like that in? Oh, well, for him, it was contact. Okay, he cool, cool. Be, yeah, he was really involved in the art and the story, you know, and he he really, he was, I mean, I don't know if he ever tried painting or anything, but. Um, he had a sense for that, you know, um, just the way he would describe what he wanted and his idea of the story. He was really into stories in his songs and the story and the painting. And he liked all the symbols and all this kind of stuff. And that was so much fun because I, I'm into that too. I love story and I love symbols. Um, so it was really, it was a lot of fun to work with him on that stuff. But um, so yeah, with the corporate things, you know, it just depends. Like each job is a whole different thing, you know, and sometimes it's very impersonal. Um, and every once in a while you get to talk to somebody who's kind of more the driving force behind it all. So, uh, Julie, out of all your work over the years, you know, be it a cover, commission, whatever, what have you, which would you consider the most challenging as the one that you've lost sleep over? Oh, lost sleep over. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't lose sleep over that anymore because <laughs> good <too> sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I have had to learn to say to myself, it's just a painting. This is not, and nobody's going to live or die on this painting. <laughs> this is just <laughs> painting, you know? Um, so, but yeah, I, like early on, like definitely I would like when I was learning how to, I don't know if you've ever seen the stuff I did where I would paint shiny metal, like chrome type surfaces. Um, when I was starting to learn that and try to understand what makes it work, um, my mind was just going all the time trying to understand it and figure it out. And I would definitely be sleeping and dreaming how that works. And <laughs> it would be up and I would be like, yeah, that's how it goes. No, that's not how it goes. You know, it was just like really a lot of rearranging of neurons in my head <laughs> to make that <laughs> to make that work it was it was interesting yeah have you ever considered uh teaching well i i have done a little bit of teaching i taught a few uh semesters of life drawing at a local art school where i live now in pennsylvania and i um but besides that i um i am part of the i was part of the faculty when it was still happening of the illustration master class called imc that was um, this group, I think there were like eight or 10 core faculty members and Boris and I were two of them. Um, it was organized by Rebecca Gay. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. her. Yeah, she's amazing. And so she organized this group of, uh, we were all friends that all um, came together to teach this week long workshop up in Massachusetts. And it was really intense and we would all go around and work with each student and that kind of thing. And then it just, you know, it went for a pretty long time, over 10 years. I don't remember how many years it was, maybe 15. And then uh, it was kind of coming to an end right around when COVID started. And then it just kind of got thrown from there. So. Mm. Yeah. so with the teaching that you have done, what would you say is the, uh, the biggest hiccup or hang up that affects early young artists, I guess? It, Absolutely. The biggest hiccup hang up is uh, using good reference material to make your art with. And so many artists, myself included when I was younger, think that a quote real artist just makes it all up out of your head and it comes out like this gold stuff, you know, and it's just not like that, you know, like really and truly you look back on you know, all the old masters and, you know, all of these people through history that make beautiful art, they had models. They might not have had photographs, but they had models. And a lot of gorgeous stuff is made just through imagination, but it's usually after quite a bit of time spent 
working from some kind of model or reference material. Um, and so many artists just either want to do it all out of their head because they're it's like really just your ego is stopping you from saying, I'm humbling myself to the fact that I don't know everything <laughs> and I need new information to make this look the way I want it to look. And if you can just get off your high horse and say, okay, I'm not perfect. I need to start from the beginning and understand this thing I'm trying to create here. If you can do that, you can take yourself so much further. Yeah, that I think that's the number one thing. Or a lot of times they'll will say, you know, get reference for yourself and they'll get something that's just kind of what they want, but not really. And they're feeling like, well, I'm going to make up the rest. And it's like, okay, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure if you're trying to make it have any kind of realism to it. You know, I'm talking about if you're trying to go for realism, it's really in the beginning learning stages. Reference is key. Later, when you've got your own internal library, you can let go a lot more. Still, anytime you need to bring realism to your work, reference is going to be your your key to that. Well said. So who would you consider your personal artistic influences? Besides Boris, you mean? Besides okay. Boris, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and besides my sons, because they're amazing. <laughs> um, they're both professionals also, and they really are. I mean, they, they've influenced me to just think outside of the box that I had been thinking in, uh, my two sons and their art. And uh, really just seriously, man, everybody, there's so many artists out there that just bring their own, you know, vision to what they're doing. And it's just so mind expanding to really, you know, just take it all in with the, with the internet. I, that's one thing I love about the internet is being able to really just see so much stuff that you wouldn't really normally see unless you spent your whole life looking at books or something. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I really, you know, I mean, I really like the work of like Eastern European artists from the early 20th century. They did all kinds of really cool, really cool stuff. Um, and I really love also the things like Waterhouse and, mm. you know, all the Art Nouveau stuff like Mucha. Um so many artists that I love. And I realized the other day that um, Andy Warhol was a big influence on me. The first artist that I ever really thought about as an artist that I could think of because when I was in like first grade or something, my teacher brought in some things of Andy Warhol and they were, and it was just like a really interesting thought that she was really wanting us to experiment in our minds, I guess. She was a really great little first grade teacher <laughs> and she um she wanted us to think about how he was taking things that were meant to be like commercially used but they were actually art in themselves and then it just made you think about the artists that made those you know soup labels or whatever to yeah. begin with and it's like you didn't I never thought of that as art until whatever you know when I when that happened and then he made another art from that so it was just a kind of an interesting thought change, you know. It's not yeah. really influencing how I make my art, but it it changed my thinking. Right, right. Um, so what would you say is the best art related advice you've been given throughout your career and who gave it to you? Was it Boris? Well for sure. That was <laughs> what the first thing he told me was get yourself some good reference. Really, really yeah. the very first thing he said <laughs> <laughs> by looking at my art that I was trying to do it all out of my head. And uh he saw it, you know, and you can see that in somebody's art if they're just making it up. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, you know, you could be really good if you get yourself some good reference and you work from that. So it really is the number one if you're trying to do realism. Um, but also, you know, really, um, I think, um, you know, at this point, you know, I've, I've learned like a lot of things about skills and, you know, how to construct a piece of art and that kind of thing and you know get it to do the thing you want it to do whatever its purpose is but the thing that um that i i find now to be really important to work on is to really you know honor what is my own personal um filter you know because uh it's like 
I'm the only one that's me, no right. matter what, you know, and other people might want to do my style or whatever, but they're not going to be me and they're not going to bring to it something that if I can really get my real inner self to come into this piece of art, um, nobody else can do that. And it's really something that makes me feel like, wow, it is actually really a precious thing for everybody to honor that thing that they have that's just them and to put it into something that they can communicate that thing to the world, you know, and let other people experience it. It's, it makes you feel like it has to be something really special. Yeah. You're the only one that has it, you know? And so, um, yeah, I'm trying to more and more let that be my, um, you know, thing that I hold on to. Well said. Uh, earlier you mentioned you had this psychedelic psychedelic viewpoint of the world almost. Have you ever had a, a psychedelic experience? <laughs> I, I have not. I have not <laughs> ever experienced that. Uh, I almost did once I was like maybe 19 years old or something. Um, there was a friend of mine. I was living in Upper Michigan at the time in a place on Lake Superior. And um, uh, this friend was a girl who really you know had done that a bunch of times and so i was she just would talk about it, it sounded like it sounds really cool and i want to try that and so she was actually going to get some for me and i was going to do that and then she was like you know what i don't want you to do this you're already there and i don't want to <laughs> mess it up <laughs> well that's and good I'm, so glad, I'm really glad i didn't you know and i really think she's right because the more I hear about it, yeah, people have these amazing, you know, experiences and visions and stuff. But honest to God, I just love my brain so much. And I, I, I would not want to dishonor it by doing something weird like that to it. Right, right. Good, good, good on you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we we uh, danced around this earlier, but uh, have you ever had an experience you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Um, I have... The only thing that comes really close to that, it's, um, I kind of have a weird feeling when I'm with somebody and I know it's the last time I will ever see them. Don't make me cry. But <laughs> that's happened to me so many times that, um, you know, it makes me feel like something about it. And um, so that's one thing. And I also have had a couple of times a feeling of like something really bad is going to happen and then it did. Hmm. And there was no reason to really think that, but that has happened a few times. So it's more like a feeling that came to me about a thing that would happen uh, more than like, you know, an intuition know what, or something like that. Yeah. An intuition type thing. Yeah. Almost a, almost a, a really like, connection with my two sons with things that have happened with them that I felt something when it happened. So uh, on a lighter note, have you, have you seen yeah, any? That's, that was scary. Sorry. <laughs> have, you, have you seen any good movies lately? <laughs> oh, um, I really haven't gotten to go to the movies much lately, you know, and uh, yeah, no, no, mm-mm. -mm. How about you? I don't. I like. I like horror movies, so I don't know if. Oh, do yeah. Do you, are you a I horror fan? It. Okay. I well, I was, I was going to recommend some, but that's that. You definitely don't want to watch this. Then. Yeah. <laughs> no, like seriously, when I saw this movie, "What Lies Beneath," which is probably like most people think of as like not that big a deal, but I really thought it was a heart attack. Is that the Harrison <laughs> Ford movie? Yeah, that was so scary. It wasn't even. I think it was just him being a bad guy instead of. Supernatural, right? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think killed his wife or something in that spoilers. movie. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, spoilers. Yep. <laughs> well, Julia, I don't have much left for you here, but just to put a bow on this, uh, what's on the horizon for you? What can you share with us? What's coming down the pipeline? Um, some things that I can't say that are secret, so we won't talk no about No problem. <laughs> I get that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, like I mentioned, there's going to be this really big epic new Elric piece besides this other epic Elric piece. So that's going to be really cool. And uh, Boris and I are working on paintings right now that are some of them are private commissions from different people, um, but they're going to be in our workman fantasy calendar for 2026. So we wow. work pretty far ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say. Yeah. So yeah. And just, you know, a lot of stuff every day going, going <laughs> things feels like 
a billion chihuahuas biting my feet. But <laughs> <laughs> do you have any pets? I, yeah, um, I have. We one of our dogs just died in February, so oh, we had no. two dogs, but now we have the one still, and um, she's awesome little doggy. And um, yeah, I really yeah. love animals. My wife That's and I have three dogs and seven cats. Oh wow, yeah. seven cats yeah. and three dogs. Yeah. That's sweet. What kind of dogs do you have? I have a. He's a Great Dane mix. He's mixed with a uh, Norwegian uh, Ridgeback. Oh my god! And we have a pit bull and we have a wiener dog. Uh-huh. <laughs> and the wiener dog's the king of them all, right? He is. His name is Romeo, <laughs> and he lives up to the name. <laughs> <laughs> so, is the one with the great this Great Dane mixed with the Ridgeback? Is he really gigantic? He is. He's huge, and he's a big baby. We yeah. call him Biff. I named him after Biff from Back to the Future. He was big, <laughs> but he's a big baby. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. I love it. <laughs> well, Julia, thank you for giving me some of your time, and I appreciate you. Big fan of your work. Thank you. Thank you. That was and, really fun.